how do i control moods when i am in a good mood i am very productive i am able to get lot of things done but when i am not in a good mood i am not able to get anything done he asked okay you are being affected by mood okay who are you i said swami i am your student and swami was not satisfied with that answer he kind of pestered a little bit more and said no no tell me who are you and then i said uh, swami you only and then swami responded swami gave the whole tray in my hand and then pointed his finger towards me and said you are mine most beloved bhagwan respected elders dear brothers and sisters a sai ram to one and all and onam asham sakal it cannot be a more apt day than onam for me to have this wonderful opportunity to talk in dharam kshetra in fact uh, the very first interaction that bhagwan had uh, with me in regards to uh, you know as a personal service or as a attendant to him was to enquire about the kerala youth who had landed in uh, prashanthi nilayam in april for the uh, vishu celebrations in fact uh, swami had that time mentioned to me that uh, uh, well kerala var vandara entha mandi undaro chudu the kerala people have come go find out how many people have come so at that point in time i had no understanding of uh, the chain of command the line by which you know you get the instructions or anything like that so swami has told then immediately went to uh, where the, the orange cars i remember they were wearing that time they were all sitting i went there and asked one of the uh, people there like uh, uh, how many of you are there and someone was answering that time uh, professor mukundan who was the state president of kerala he immediately came there running and like the hallmark of greatness they say is humility and that is something which you will see constantly in prashant nile people who have been serving at very high positions and those who have been dedicated to swami will talk to a student who joined the institute two years back you know and uh, uh, who probably has absolutely no knowledge of sai literature or no knowledge of uh, the amount of work which a sai organization does with the same respect by which they would speak to swami because they do not see the distinction because when you are going and speaking to the devotees they do not see you as the person who is standing in front of them but as the messenger who has come from swami so that humility was a huge lesson to me and of course they had also immediately uh, uh, given all the information which i had the opportunity to communicate back to swami as some of you might have heard in some of my earlier talks that was the time when swami had just started talking to me and uh, being someone from chennai i wanted to use that opportunity that uh, swami was very in a very rare uh, instance of swami being in prashant nilayam for tamil new year's day and vishu which were like subsequent days so we wanted to put up a drama on uh, uh, on some literature of the in from tamil which some of us who were staying back in hostel after our vacation were well versed with so i took the opportunity to write the script and you know we wanted to take it to bhagwan fortunately had the wisdom that time to go and ask a teacher like is this something which we can do can we go and approach swami and ask because when swami starts talking to you like uh, professor bhagya says we first become chatterjees then we become banerjees we start uh, talking to everyone that you know now you know i am an important person swami is talking to me and i am i am this form boy i'll carry this banner saying that you know uh, if anything has to go let it go through me i can i can talk anything to swami you very easy for us to fall into that trap 
and so that is when i also kind of fell into the trap and thought you know this is the time for me to uh, initiate this uh, drama performance which our uh, our batch can do our batch was blessed with multiple opportunities to perform skits uh, you know dance programs speeches and all those things during our two years we were little spoiled to uh, to say it lightly then i took this to one of the teachers who were uh, in charge for us in the hostel and then we went to them and told that sir this is something which we are thinking of this is something we can do and uh, being a little over smart that i was i already went and spoke to the kerala and tamil nadu state presidents at that time and they all said no no if the students program is there definitely swami will enjoy we should have that right so they immediately said yes so once i went to uh, the teacher then the teacher kind of explained to me uh, someone very wet behind the ears that these people have not practiced for one or two days you are today writing a script and thinking about putting up a drama in 3 days these people have been practicing for months for this one opportunity to come in front of swami and perform do you think it is correct for us to go and take to swami a different proposal for a program and that is when kind of it sunk in that proximity does not mean dearness proximity does not mean understanding proximity does not imply that it is an opportunity for you to do what you want uh, those videos kind of kindled a lot of memories and sorry for digressing a little but yes in many ways uh, kerala and onam have been integral to lot of the chiseling which has happened in my life in bhagwan's fort so chiseling has a happening what does this topic even imply what does this even mean very often we get caught in this loop of cause and effect swami is talking to that boy because he has been doing so and so Swami is not talking to that person because I heard he was involved in such and such, right? Very easily we try to analyze the actions of Bhagwan, who is beyond the comprehension of our the limited company of our senses. Swami says, "Your your eyes cannot perceive beyond a wavelength. Your ears cannot perceive beyond a frequency." and yet with this limited company you think that you can comprehend the vastness of bhagwan's creation of his grace and his intent how foolish can we be if we think that we can analyze and understand what leads to bhagwan's actions the more i started understanding no i shouldn't say understanding realizing or being aware of the fact that unless we separate ourselves from what is happening to us we can neither witness the happening nor can we realize the chiseling we all say why do you go to bhagwan he says we go to bhagwan because we want to get transformed i remember uh, i was doing my engineering and uh, i had this opportunity to do mba in prashant nilayam and i was planning to go there so i had a friend who uh, studied with me in school as well as in engineering and i knew him for many years even lived in the same neighborhood so he asked me what is it what is your plan what are you going to do 
I know you wrote uh, CAT, MAT, RAT, SAT and all those entrance examinations for MBA. Finally, where are you going to go? I said, uh, no, I'm going to Prashanti Nilayam. I'm going to go to Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning. I'm going to do my MBA there. He was extremely surprised. Then he asked, why, what, what are the reasons for you to go there? So I said, no, I'm going there for my own transformation. Again, uh, a textbook answer, right? When you don't know what you want to say, you, you say what the literature says, you say what everybody else says. Then this immediate question was, no, but you are not a bad boy. <laughs> right? So the, the idea then was like, is Puttaparthi is like a military school. A person who is completely indisciplined would go there to gain discipline. So he was like, you are not a, a, a wayward person. You, are not, you don't need to go there and get transformed. What is it that you want to get transformed for? I did not have an answer that time. I just smiled and uh, we continued doing what we were doing. But the interesting thing which happened was that there was transformation. We often think that transformation implies bad to good. And more importantly, looking bad to looking good. What I realized was all my life, all my youth, I had been obsessed with the need to look good, with the need to be someone who does not get any remarks, need to be someone who you know, gets good name for the family, gets good name for parents, you know, all those kind of things. But internally, I would feel extremely impure. The reason I would feel impure, again, which is something, uh, a realization which came many years later, was because I was not addressing what was happening within me as something, as a, something whole, right? We are always trying to have a narration around it, we are always trying to have a story around it. And anything which looks good is something which you project outside. Anything which does not look good is something which you hide inside. And more and more when this, we do this, it becomes more and more toxic. I did realize that I was developing a lot of self-pity, self-hate and all those kind of negative uh, scenarios going on. So Bhagwan always says, reflection, reaction, resound. Yadbhavam tadbhavati. What is your thought? That is how the world reflects back to you. So when we face the world by looking good, but having all these feelings, of self-inadequacy, self the world will reflect that back to you. And that is what happened to me. I was low on confidence. At one side, I was getting scores, I was getting marks, and those things were going on. But I did not have the confidence to face the world. I was feeling extremely inadequate. But here is the interesting part. Swami says that what you give to the world is what the world reflects back to you. But he does not say what we give to Bhagwan. how does that come back to us? So when we are in the presence of Bhagwan, there is no world to reflect back our own feelings of self-inadequacy. We get to be the ones who reflect what Bhagawan's opinion of us are. Because when Swami sees us, He sees us as the reflection of His own purity. 
we remember with great amusement when bhagwan would tell stories about the students he would tell about the idealness of the student life about how all the students would be absolute perfections how everyone would get up get up on time for suprabhatam how everybody would be uh, in fact swami would say that the students would soak the rice from previous day and the next day they will mix some majjiga or uh, buttermilk with that and that is what they eat for breakfast because it's very healthy the previous night at 12 o'clock we would have uh, taken rice from hostel mixed it with pickle and eaten we had a proper rajasik dinner but bhagwan saw us from his eyes bhagwan saw us from the way he knew we could be bhagwan saw in us the potential so all these places where bhagwan chose to give himself to give his love unconditionally and to walk amidst us be it prashanti nilayam be it dharmakshetra be it brindavan be it uh, sundaram be it sai shruti be it uh, be it shivam be it any of these holy places which bhagwan has breathed in lived in it contains within it his own reflection reaction and resound in the years they had they had the immense opportunity to be in his presence we got to witness bhagwan as a personality he was as human as human can be and every now and then provide the flicker of his divinity to kind of keep us grounded in his human existence there is nothing which any of us have faced that he has not faced all the difficulties all the jubilations nothing ha- did he prevent himself from facing and that is why when he says my life is my message we can take it with pure authenticity because bhagwan experienced every emotion that a human being is expected to experience and i got to got an absolute beautiful privilege to witness every one of those emotions they say that swami is a possessive god got to witness his envy as well got to witness his but there is one emotion of his that we never witnessed we have never seen swami afraid we have never seen fear cross his eyes because swami says the opposite of love is not hate the opposite of love is fear how can fear exist when love itself is walking on two feet the reason why i mention that every place of his is suffused with his reflection reaction and resound is that i got the taste of this during my the first stint in prashant nilayam after i got my admission into mba i entered prashant portals of prashant nilayam swami was still in brindavan at that point in time and uh, we were uh, left to face the sun the humidity and the mosquitoes it is a very interesting experience being in prashant nilayam before swami makes his appearance and yet despite swami at, i mean at that point it was it was very easy for us to kind of distinguish between the physical and the ethereal 
So physically Bhagavan was not in Prashanti Nilayam. And I as a student or as a devotee had not really experienced much time with him as a personality. As brother introduced, Swami had come to my life in the form of a photograph when I was seven years old. And that is a picture which used to be in our altar. But the only darshan we have had of Swami was the Dur darshan. So Swami would come to Sundaram or Abbotsbury in Chennai and uh, he would be in the balcony. And we would not even know what is the timing of darshan or anything else like that. So we would just go there on a random time when my father was free. And uh, a couple of times when we went there, Swami was giving darshan from the balcony. I remember my father lifting me on his shoulders so that I could have his darshan from long distance. And that was the proximity which we had. So this was the first time in Prashanti Nilayam. And me, as I was growing up in my childhood, I was a pretty sickly child. I used to fall sick very often. Uh, and so I used to be extremely protected. I was also the first grandchild of uh, my maternal family and uh, also pretty close to everyone in my paternal family and I used to be extremely protected. So with protection you get security but you also have fear. And one of the fears which I had was of stray dogs. I used to be extremely afraid of stray dogs, I used to be afraid of monkeys. And in Puttaparthi there was no shortage of dogs or monkeys, both with and without tails. So during my very first walk from hostel to Mandir, we were walking across uh, the Ishwarama school and that entire school, that area was, there were some 10, 12 monkeys sitting there. And to my surprise, I was feeling no fear. And then I crossed and then there were stray dogs everywhere and that fear disappeared as well. And to this day that fear has not returned. So that for me was the first miracle that I experienced. And it was experienced in absentia. And that is when I understood the value of Stala Prabhavam, the, the value of being in a place which was chosen by the avatar. A place which has witnessed his presence it has its own magic, it has its own miracle, it has its own uh, glory because it has been the recipient of the reflection, reaction and resound of Bhagwan himself. As I narrate many of these experiences, Being in the financial capital of India, I am reminded of one interesting experience which we had. So, there were five of us that time around Swami and Swami used to call us Panchapandavas. I have the privilege today of being one of three in this hall who were part of that group. So, hold me true here. There was this one particular doctor who was extremely devoted in a childlike manner, Swami, and every now and then he would be leaping with one letter in his hand. So Swami would joke with him and pick up that letter. And one day he came inside the uh, interview room and we were all sitting there. And one thing that we have witnessed is in our time with Bhagwan is the predominant time that Swami spends throughout the day is with letters. He is constantly reading letters, whether he is sitting in the interview room, whether he is at the dining table, wherever he is, there is always a bunch of letters next to him and that is what he is constantly consuming. On this particular day, Swami took this letter 
and there was a mischievous glint in his eyes, so we knew something was coming. So we had as our practice, our head down and uh, had the opportunity to do Pad Seva and we would not look up unless Swami was talking to us. And Swami suddenly told us and said, Ikeda chudu. Then Swami was holding up a check. So we have heard so many stories of you know, Swami taking up a check and saying and this did not come in the correct means and tearing it up. So we thought we were going to experience something like this. But in this case, Swami just said, See, inta pedda check chadu. See what a big check he gave. Then we were silent. We don't know how to respond to this. Then he said, Munna ne inka, inka oka pedda check chadu. Even some days back, he gave a big amount. We are like, we never had an experience having such kind of conversation with Swami. What is Swami trying to say? And then uh, we, were, we didn't know what to respond. And then Swami said, Nenu tank la pettu nanu, wallet tap open chesi istu naru. I am putting in the tank, they are opening the tap and giving. Is that not true? for every one of the actions that we do. We think that we are standing here as speakers giving talk. Who is going to come and listen to someone if he did not have the association of the Lord Himself? If Bhagwan had not poured all that love and all that experiences in the tank, what is going to come out of the tap? We think we are great, you know, great performers, great singers, great musicians. But where does all that come if the talent was not given by him, if the opportunity was not provided by him, if the chiseling had not happened through him? I remember one beautiful incident. There is an excellent flutist in Prashanti Nilayam who still serves in the ashram. And before bhajans, he had the opportunity to play flute. It was on, on that particular day, there was there was something in the air and the sound of that melody was extremely beautiful and everybody was enthralled by it. And that was during the gap between the alap and the bhajan. So at the end of the performance, the singer started singing the bhajan. So after that bhajan was over, very uncharacteristically, Swami started talking in the bhajan hall. Typically when bhajan starts, there are no conversations. It goes on all the way till Aarti and during Aarti, Swami uh, accepts the Aarti and walks out of the bhajan hall. That used to be, if any conversation would happen, it would happen before the bhajan starts. But this day suddenly Swami started talking and then everybody felt silent. What is this that Swami is talking? Then Swami said, Vada chudu, inta bhaga And everybody was like, yes, Swami. It was an extremely beautiful uh, play, playing. And it, before I continue, I should mention this. It is to the credit of the devotee or the student if Swami chooses to make that person as an example of a story. Swami would not do that to a new student or someone who has just come to his fold. If Swami uses you in a story, that is an indication that he understands or he acknowledges that you are in tune with his thought. Right? So then Swami was talking to, uh, was talking about this boy and he said, it was such a beautiful performance. 
the melody was so beautiful we were all enthralled then but there was a we all could sense that the butt was coming then swami said kani would we all be listening to him if it was not between bhajans if it was not between the namasmarana for which we are all here we knew swami was going to go somewhere here before we go to that that was a huge lesson for me because i was i had opportunity because i was sitting closer to swami to look at that student when swami was you know lifting him up to the sky and then dropping him down i could see the equanimity in his face i could see that he was unaffected by the fact that swami was praising him nor was he affected by the fact that he was dropping him down because not only was he playing an instrument but he had subjected himself to be an instrument to be played by him swami then used this instrument to tell the story that no matter how beautiful is the secular education that we are getting in prashanthi nilayam what is the use of that if it is not interspersed between the atmic education for which we are actually here every now and then swami would use an opportunity to drive a point home in a manner by which it sticks to us that years later in many other things have been forgotten these lessons do not easily fade away back during my mba days we had the opportunity to put up a program for the mba day which is a opportunity where only the mba boys the first and second year boys would have a chance to put up a program and our batch especially was extremely talented we had uh, all kinds of uh, atirathis and maharathis as we call it who were great in public speaking in uh, dramatics in music and what not so this being a smaller group and the mba of our batch was one of the first batches which was predominantly external i think we had about 45 to 50% of the students were first time students who had studied our bachelors outside and had come to mba for, to prashanthi nilayam for the first time so this was an opportunity that we all got to be in his presence and to put up some performance in front of him fortunately the few students who were there from before were able to guide us that the focus here is not our performance the focus here is to see how much time we can get of swami see how much we can uh, you know make swami spend time with us as exclusively as possible everyone wants inclusivity as long as we are not the exclusive ones to receive but when we are the ones who are receiving his grace we want it to be exclusive and that is the beauty of the avatar that he made each and every one of us feel exclusive each and every one of us are unique just like each and like e- just like everybody else so during that mba day we were all prepared with our program and i had the opportunity to be a trade union leader so i was probably the first person in the history of 
Prashanti Nilayam to look at Swami in the face and shout strike. So I was seat seated there before the program in the bhajan hall and the makeup boys were there. Typically in any uh, Prashanti Nilayam drama there would be a, there would be a contemporary base and there would be a historic uh, anecdote which would uh, involve a mythological or historical character who would have a life lesson from Swami's Chinakathas. So the makeup person was busy with uh, all those uh, uh, historical characters and then I remember going to that person and asking, do I need to put any makeup? You know, I have got a lot of uh, dialogues. So he said, no, what is your character? I, I said, trade union leader. He said, you look perfect as it is, go and sit. So we were seated there in the bhajan hall. And Bhagwan came to the bhajan hall before the program. He was interacting with some of the students who were there and uh, Remember, Professor Sudhir Bhaskar sir was there in front, uh, who as, as our champion. He was trying the be his best to make sure that Swami spends as much time as possible with, uh, with all of us. And then uh, Swami said, If you have any doubts, you ask. Veteran devotees of Bhagwan and veteran students know that this is the time to silence your mind. But we were all new, we were all uh, fresh and wet between our ears and we thought this is what a great opportunity this is. And we all started raising our hands. Initially we were all kind of reluctant, so Sudhir Bhaskar sir in his, uh, asked us a few questions to kind of get the conversation moving. And then slowly we all took courage and started raising our hands. So my opportunity came, I raised my hand and then Swami looked at me and asked, what is your question? Then I said, Swami, how do I control moods? When I'm in a good mood, I'm very productive. I'm able to get a lot of things done. But when I'm not in a good mood, I'm not able to get anything done. I'm just sitting there doing nothing. How can I control that? So I expected a 10 point code of conduct now to say, okay, this is step one, step two, step three. But instead, Bhagawan touched on the most fundamental piece of it all. He questioned my very identity. He asked, Okay, you are being affected by mood. Okay, who are you? I said, Swami, I'm your student. He said, no, no, who are you? Then uh, I said, uh, uh, Swami, uh, I am, uh, I think, I, I think I, the response I gave was that Swami tells you're not one but three. So I said, Swami, I am the one who I really am or something like that. And Swami was not satisfied with that answer. He kind of pestered a little bit more and said, no, no, tell me, who are you? And then I said, uh, Swami, you only. Then Swami said, in Tamil. You should not tell like that. Because it was not coming out of authenticity. It was coming out of textbook. Then, uh, then I said, Swami, the Atman Swami, then Swami responded, you find out that, then you will not be affected by these moods. I remember uh, a story of Ramana Maharishi, who, uh, which I got to read many years later, where a, a disciple asked Ramana, there are so many people come here with different ailments and they have different levels of understanding. To everyone you keep saying, uh, who am I, who am I, who am I? How will people understand this? Why can't you give them something easier to digest? 
And it was written that Maharishi responds, saying that when I have the medicine which can cure all diseases, why would I go, go around prescribing more lesser, more lesser effective medicines to everyone? So in this case, when irrespective of what we think of ourselves, what we believe our own potential is, Bhagawan seeing his reflection in us provides that response which he knows will lead to the happening of the chiseling in the long run. Let me narrate a few other instances of this chiseling which I was subject to. So this was one of those days where uh, the Pancha Pandavas were sitting inside the interview room and uh, Swami was in a very uh, humorous and uh, happy mood. And he started uh, asking us what our name was and what the meaning of our name was. So, uh, before that he was like, uh, he kind of asked all of us, you are Pancha Pandavas, so Dharmajuru Yavaru, who is the Dharmaja here? And none of, there was no confusion, we all looked at Nithinacharya brother and said, Swami, he is our Dharmaja, he is our leader. And then Swami looked at him and said, uh, okay, what is your name? He said, uh, Swami Nitin. And Swami said, what does that mean? He said, Swami, it is, uh, uh, it is a name for Krishna. So it was a very, very proper, good answer. And then Swami looked at me. And uh, somehow I felt that I was reflecting a mischievous mood from Swami. And uh, Swami looked at me and asked, what is your name? I said, uh, Swami, my name is Harish. Then Swami said, uh, Hari ente Yemi. And Swami did not even say Harish, we very specifically said Hari ente Yemi. So then I thought, this was really, my, uh, my reading was right. And I said, Swami, Hari ente monkey. Then Swami looked startled, you know, apparently. And then he said, uh, why are you saying like that? Then I said, Swami, you have only told. And I narrated to Swami his own chinnakata of uh, <laughs> how Narada once in one of those universes was attracted by a princess who would had uh, said that she will get married to only somebody with a Hari Mukha. So Narada goes to Narayana and prays to him that he blesses him with Hari Mukha so that he can go and uh, get married to this princess. And the story goes that he goes into the hall with everybody laughing. And he thinks that, wow, everybody is in such a joyous mood today. And he goes in front of the princess being very sure that, she, he, uh, that he will be the one she garlands. But instead she gets scared of him and runs away. And then apparently he looks at himself in the, his reflection and realizes that his face is one of monkey. And then he goes back to Narayana and the story continues. But as I was telling, I realized that I was not have, my audience was not captive. And I was over speaking at this point. So I, I became silent in the middle of the story. Then Swami kind of started uh, telling, so your parents have kept this name. No, you cannot... Uh, uh, you cannot make joke of this name. Okay, Swami. And I felt very bad that, you know, that there were three more of us in the room and Swami was in such a good mood, he was asking these questions and because of my response, the other three did not get an opportunity to answer. Apologies again. After that, Bhagwan came to uh, the bhajan hall. And after sitting in the bhajan hall, he continued the same conversation. 
he started looking at some bhajan boys and started asking them what their name is and what the meaning of their name is. A couple of students answered. And then Swami again turned towards me and asked me one more time, what is your name? I said Swami Harish and before I could even complete that, immediately Swami shouted in, 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 in Swami's loud whisper, as you could call it, Hari and Te Monkey. Whole bhajan hall started roaring in laughter. Unlike the other student who maintained equanimity, my face lost all its color. I was absolutely shocked. I was awestruck. Just now when I cracked the same joke, the Swami, he looked so offended. And now he is telling the same joke to everyone else. But such is the infectious nature of Bhagwan's humor that no matter how you feel, you cannot but help but join in. And I joined with everyone on the laughter and the day ended that, that way. But many years later, when I contemplated on uh, this particular incident, I remembered a very important statement which Bhagwan had made. This was in 2005 Kodai. So we were seated in Sai Shruti uh, along with other students and uh, suddenly someone from the kitchen came and called said, Swami is calling uh, you. And I got up and went inside. The Swami was in the pathway which comes from the kitchen to the hall where all the students were and uh, Elders were seated and Swami was holding in his hands a tray full of watches. Now we all know the spiritual significance which Swami always tells about watches. Holding that whole tray of watches, Swami gave the whole tray in my hand and then pointed his finger towards me and said, You are mine. You are mine. Some of you might have listened to some other talks of mine where I talk about and a different chiseling which was happening to me in Kodai that year. And why my response at that point was not exactly how you would have expected it to be. But putting two and two together now, I realized that so complete is Bhagawan's ownership of us. When we say that Bhagawan is a possessive God, we mean it in the sense that He owns us completely. So much so that we do not even have the right to mock our own name. Even that right has been relegated to Him. Only he has the right to even make fun of us. When that understanding dawned, there was also a wave of gratitude. As and when we reflect on the various happenings of our life, we slowly and surely start recognizing and being aware of the chiseling that has been taking, taking place all through. Forget about these indirect messages. Even direct messages of Bhagwan are not often perceived by us directly. So accustomed do we become in his proximity that we confuse his humanness for humanity. And we start correcting Swami for his own words.
in 2005 after i had uh, completed my mba when swami gave this opportunity to walk beside him i was still uncomfortable because you know as the saying goes form is temporary so today swami is talking tomorrow he may not now how do we kind of stay get retained in prashanti nilayam how to stay back in prashanti nilayam it is good if i secure a job in the ashram if swami gives me some job in ashram then i can stay here irrespective of you know whether or not swami is talking to me or not so we all make our own schemes our own plans about what we feel is the requisites for our actions so i started requesting swami swami please give me some uh, opportunity in uh, in the ashram so then immediately swami said in central trust lo auditor ka chestanu i'll make you an auditor in central trust evarena tappu cheste if anybody makes any mistake ఏమి భయం లేకుండా స్వామి దగ్గర వచ్చి చెప్పవచ్చు వితౌట్ ఎనీ ఫియర్ యూ కెన్ కమ్ అండ్ టెల్ స్వామి రైట్ సో స్వామి వాజ్ బెస్ట్ ఓవింగ్ ద హయ్యెస్ట్ రోల్ యాస్ యు నో ద వే హీ వాజ్ డిస్క్రైబింగ్ ఇట్ అండ్ ఎట్ సచ్ ఇస్ అవర్ ఓన్ ఒపీనియన్ ఆఫ్ అవర్ సెల్ఫ్ డిస్పైట్ కాన్స్టెంట్ ఎవిడెన్సెస్ దట్ స్వామి హాస్ ప్రొవైడ్ ప్రొవైడెడ్ that he does not call the qualified he qualifies the called every instance of my life every interaction with bhagwan every opportunity that i had got were all for things that i was absolutely unqualified for and yet he has lifted me up and he has provided me each and every one of those opportunities and yet again when he was trying to do something like this i responded to him saying swami na finance background ledu i don't have bcom uh, background i did mba swami i did mba marketing swami where ekade na pani iste manchidi so swami please give me job somewhere else right when bhagwan himself is giving you an opportunity and that too with he is advertising with such beautiful words yet you know the, the your own self of worth your own uh, sense of self keeps you down many many years later in 2018 i decided that at that point i was in international trade i was uh, traveling across countries i was uh, uh, you know distributing pro- products so i was getting tired of that i said no i need to get into a different type of role so i wanted to do another course so there was this opportunity in a university in the us for me to do a master so i went there did my masters and during the masters i had an, there was a networking event from walmart the company which uh, brother was talking about where i have the opportunity to work with now where uh, there was a requirement for a data analytics role so i went and spoke to that person and it seemed fit and we went through the entire process and i got in the interesting thing was despite the fact that the role was one of data analytics the department where this role was based was global audit and as and when i started working there i started realizing that i was less of an analyst and more of an auditor so it may take as many years but every word of bhagwan will come true and it has to come true there was another occasion in kodai in 2005 when uh, swami gave his first interview to my parents and then uh, you know swami was asking about uh, 
uh, about my parents' well-being and he was telling my parents about me. Oh, he's, uh, he's such and such, you know, the way uh, how only Swami can pep you up. And then uh, Swami said, he, this boy even sings very well. Then Swami looked at me and said, Tu padata kada? Then very diplomatically answered, Swami, I follow bhajans. Then Swami said, Kadu, no lead che ochu. You can lead bhajans. I stayed silent. I knew the quality of the bhajan singers who were seated outside. And to even, you know, go and wag my tail there was not something which I was prepared to. But again, many years later, this particular role which I was talking about in Walmart is in a remote town called Bentonville in a state called Arkansas, which many people in the US are not aware of, of its existence. I remember so much so that uh, during the orientation of, uh, in Walmart, the people talking about Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, in some very familiar terms, they said that this place used to be a stone's throw away from Stone Age. And today there is an airport here. I was like, I've heard this dialogue somewhere else. So in this particular place, again, there was no size center. Incidentally, we, uh, there was an um, interest for music, there were uh, interest of group were singing devotional music together. And one such group, we invited them home and we had Sai Bhajans and uh, there are a lot of experiences, many of them started facing after being part of it. Like very often we think that we are introducing Swami but visiting cards have already come in. But the interesting thing which happened during that time was even though many of them were accomplished singers, they did not know about the way to sing Sai Bhajans. So then being the only male Sai devotee there who was aware of Sai Bhajans, I had the, the unique responsibility to teach all these people how to sing Sai Bhajans. So I would lead the Bhajans for them to you know, start learning about how to sing. And even that had to come true. So every word of Bhagwan definitely comes true. To help out Brother Parikshit on his conclusion, I thought I will probably conclude with some takeaways. Like any other talk, of course, I came here intending to talk something and Swami, of course, took it in a totally different direction. But nevertheless, some of the basic themes that I felt that Bhagwan was trying to communicate through this imperfect instrument today was to number one, Recognizing Bhagavan's reflection, reaction and resound in us and associating ourselves as frequently as we can with such places of divine potency where unknowingly to us Bhagwan's divine reflection exists and operates on us and chisels us as an invisible happening. So let us make the effort to visit the places where Bhagwan has been and to spend as much time as we can in all those divine abodes of Bhagwan. Secondly, I know I didn't cover this in detail, but let's not be too quick in judging the spiritual progress 
or forget anybody else but of ourselves. Very often we keep, we start feeling down thinking that, you know, Swami has given us so much. What are we doing today? Have we got caught in this world? Have we forgotten Him? Have we forgotten His lessons? Let us remember His words that our life is in His hands. Swami has looked at each and every one of our eyes deeply and said that you are mine. Is it possible that our life can go astray? Is it possible that our life would go in a route which was not designated by Him? Is it possible that we are going through anything in our life if it was not meant for the happening of our own chiseling. We keep talking about chiseling. What is it that this chiseling is all about? Bhagavan tells in Chinnakata of a man who very beautifully carves excellent idols of Krishna. It is so much so that anyone who is in the presence of those idols cannot but feel that they are in the presence of Lord Himself. So a person went to him and asked, How is it that you chisel? What is it that you do? What is the process by which you make such immaculate idols? Then he said, What are you talking about? I have not once chiseled an idol of Krishna. Krishna already exists in each and every one of those stones. All that which I chisel out is that which is not Krishna. No matter what questions that we have, no matter what is it that we are facing, no matter what is that one thing which that we feel that we need to overcome, Bhagavan has given one response to all of that. Understand your identity. I talked with you, I started my talk talking about transformation. I talked about how we always used to think that transformation meant bad to good. But what I slowly started to understand, to started to realize or to be aware of in his presence, I remember a story of uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, where apparently Swami Vivekananda and uh, Rakel were to take a boat and cross to come to Dakshineshwar. Apparently the boatmen would hurl abuses about Ramakrishna. And Vivekananda gave back the boatman in, in equal words and kind of asserted the dominance of his guru. How can someone talk so low of my guru? So apparently when Vivekananda comes back in Ramakrishna's presence, Ramakrishna says, you should not have behaved like this. You let your anger go astray. You should control. You should learn to be silent. The next day, the same incident happens with Rakel. And he stays silent. And when he comes back, comes to Dakshineshwar, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa asks him, How come you are silent? He is talking about his guru like this. Did you not feel the need to defend? 
Professor Sainath sir talks about a very similar incident which happened in Purnachandra with him and another student with very similar behavioral patterns. Every master comes down and every master teaches these lessons. So what does this mean? So should we be vocal? Should we be silent? So that the person who was loud was asked to transform to be a person who was silent. The person who was silent was asked to transform to be the person who was loud. So what then is this transformation? Slowly we become aware that the transformation which Bhagwan constantly talks about, or sorry, uh, the transformation which Bhagwan constantly brings about in all our lives is to help us understand the fluidity of what we think of our identity. We allow our self to be defined by a few personality traits and say that this is Harish. This is me, this is you. And yet, Bhagawan will break that mold. He will break our association with whatever we think is our identity. And once the awareness comes that what we identify as our identity is, is fluid, is not something which is what we have to live with, then we go back to the question of who am I? And it is the recognition of that identity which is, which Swami has very beautifully mentioned as the medicine for all that which ails us. So praying to Bhagwan to give us the strength to take the bitterness of this medicine and to be able to recover from whatever that ails us so that we start recognizing that our self is not different from him and that we our need to be his reflection, reaction and resound. Jai Sairam.